Hi, this is Joe Loria, Editor-in-Chief of Consortium News, reporting from Ljubljana, Slovenia, where the country took part in the European parliamentary elections on Sunday, June 9. At stake was the most essential issue of all, avoiding a major European war that could escalate into unimaginable consequences, as well as ending the genocide in Gaza. These two issues have been fueling third-party and independent candidates throughout the West, posing a threat to the establishment. There remain, however, formidable obstacles to challenging major party consensus, especially on the issue of peace and war. Despite the growth of social and independent media, which has sparked efforts by governments to suppress anti-war voices, often in league with the private so-called information anti-disinformation industry, the mainstream media still has tremendous clout in shaping an electorate's knowledge and even its voting behavior. Such seems to have been the case here in the European parliamentary elections in Slovenia. On election day, we followed the only prominent candidate for peace, a veteran Slovenian TV correspondent who was known to every voter after nearly five decades of reporting from around the world. We begin with the wide-ranging interview with him and then follow him to the election booth, to his gathering with supporters to watch the results, and finally to the election center where he addressed the nation live. This is also very good. Yep. This is Joe Loria for CN Live, and I'm here with Udo Slipusek, who is a candidate for the European Parliament to represent Slovenia. He would be one of nine who are going to be elected on Sunday. Udo, thank you for coming along to this interview. I've known you many years. You were well known and still are in this country, having been a TV correspondent where I met you in New York. But I remember talking to you some years ago and you mentioned that there were people who wanted to draft you to run for parliament here. Yeah, and you yeah. said, I'm not interested in politics. Why are you running now for the European Parliament? Yes, uh, that was the case. I decided to run for the membership of European Parliament because I am uh, very worried about the situation in the world, what's going on in Europe, and even what's going on in Slovenia, and I was not satisfied with our members of the parliament uh, because they do not speak, and if they are speaking, they are speaking uh, according to the orders they are getting uh, from their political affiliations outside of the country. I think this was the main reason that I decided to run for the parliament, and especially because I am very afraid of, but not only I, that Europe could become a place of the new uh, regional war, or even maybe, I don't know, I hope not uh, Armageddon, you know. And therefore I said to myself, you have to show something in your life, you have to do something to try to prevent this, even if I realize that one member in the European Parliament cannot do a lot. But if I will be elected, I will join members of undecided, undeclared candidates. I will not participate in any political affiliation and I will vote according to the national interest of Slovenia and especially of the peace, because these are the most important elections since we joined the European Union. Why? Because now we are choosing between peace and war. You said the, they have affiliations outside the country. Some of the yes, opponents. Why? Yeah, why? because all these political parties, social democrats, liberals, conservatives, uh, People's Party, they belong to the former uh, to associations of the uh, of the political parties, which they held headquarters outside of the country, and therefore they are voting more or less according to the decisions which are taken out of the country, not in accordance like with where, the Slovenian interest. Like in Washington, for example? Ah, well, Washington, Berlin, you yeah. know, Paris, mm -hmm. so, you know, the mm -hmm. most important countries are deciding uh, what to do. Right. So, you see a very dangerous situation in Europe evolving. Uh, you actually think there's a possibility of a, of a major European war, and this is what drove you mostly to come out and be, as you say, you're a peace candidate. Tell me why you fear the, uh, a European war. Uh, you know, hopefully I'm wrong, you know. Mm -hmm. But 
if you are taking uh, in account all the, the situation and all these anomalies which are going on around the Europe and especially in the world, you know, it is very scary situation. It is not only the question of a uh, war of, between Ukraine and Russia, it is a question of the general war. Who will prevail? I think now we are in the midst of the fightings for new sphere of influences, which bloc will prevail. At one hand, the United States and the Western countries, especially in Europe, they are fighting for unilateral system. That means where Pax Americana, that means America should rule together with Western countries, the world in different time. And now we have another block, which are the countries from the South, which are becoming very important in economic terms, financial terms, political terms, even military terms. Uh, and they are asking for more democratic system uh, of the world, because the system which is now in place was born after the, the Second World War. And at that time, United States produced half of the world GDP, but now it produced around 19% and China only 2% less, but the system is still the same. Therefore, these countries are asking to be more equal, but the West is not giving them the right to do so. And I think this is the most important, the most important problem. And another is also that the countries of the South are not anymore technologically disadvantaged, especially China. Now, the, the countries or the bloc of countries which will control the technological processes will rule the world. And this is a fierce fighting. And I hope that peace will prevail. You know, we have to cooperate. We have to cooperate not to be enemies anymore. I am against zero win uh, situations. So you're saying the United States and the bloc that they lead are not facing reality that the world has changed. They are no longer the preeminent power they used to be. Of course, they're very powerful. They don't want to accept being one of many power centers in the world. They still want to be that. And that's what you think is driving this most dangerous situation with Ukraine. Yes, I think this is typical proxy war. Why did it start? It, it started mainly because of the enlargement of NATO. And when the NATO come to the borders of former Soviet Union, the Russians said, no, Ukraine cannot join NATO because it will endanger our uh, situation. Because according to the Helsinki peace agreements, the security of one country cannot endanger security of another country. And this is the reason why this proxy war is going on in Ukraine. You know, what would happen if, for example, Mexico would join alliance, let me say military alliance with China or with Russia? I am sure there will be a war. You know, therefore, Americans and Western countries, they have to respect also the security interest of the others, in that case, Russia. And I think that Russia doesn't have any kind of imperial interest because it is the biggest country in the world. And second one, Russia is economically and with the population not able to conquer Europe, you know, therefore, Russia, if you're also looking back to the history, Russia was all the time defending against former invaders. Only after the Second World War, with these tampon countries, which were members of the Warsaw Pact, that was a problem, Brezhnev doctrine. And now we have an American version of Brezhnev doctrine. You know what the Brezhnev doctrine was? That no one country is completely independent, that only the big powers are ruling, you know, that in that case before Soviet Union. But now we have that reversion that only the United States is ruling, you know, the world or Western part and, and European countries, where are European countries? European countries lost all the influence and their politicians are behaving like uh, puppets, uh, like servants. And they are speaking about strategic autonomy of, of Europe. Where is that strategic autonomy? Nowhere, nowhere. And this is the, the biggest problem. Europe is becoming second grade 
region second grade party and it's working only in the function of the retaining of American world hegemony. So the, the United States has been using Ukraine since 1947 to put pressure on Russia to stage sabotage and propaganda operations from Ukraine. It began with using uh, former uh, members of the fascist Ukrainians, yeah. and they brought them to New York and they set them up. When the Cold War ended in 91, George H.W. Bush, at least he said that we, we would not make bravado out of this, we would not declare ourselves mm -hmm. winners, we would try to bring peace. But of course, in the Clinton administration, they pushed Russia, they got Yeltsin, they yes. sent in Wall yeah. Street, they yeah. worked and created a new class of oligarchs yeah. Yeah. to asset strip yeah. the former state-owned industries and dominated Russia. And then Putin came along and kicked those people out. And in my view, and I want to ask you, do you think that the West, led by the US, wants to get Russia back again in the situation of the 90s, where they can control the resources and control the so. markets? There were four enlargement of NATO. And... Uh, you know, even the Secretary General of NATO, Stoltenberg, he admitted that this was not unprovoked war, as they were insisting all the time, but provoked war with the NATO enlargement. And that the war didn't start 24th of February 22, but in... Uh, 2014. Yes, Maidan Revolution or Coup d'etat, right. you know, better to say. This is the problem. Uh, also, there in the Western countries, they don't play the problem of so-called neo-Nazi forces over there, especially in Ukraine, because you know that after 214, uh, there were 14,000 people dead because of the bombardment uh, from this uh, unregular uh, Ukrainian forces. Therefore, Russians, they had some uh, reason to be worried uh, because there were many Russians speaking or Russian nationals living in that part of Ukraine. Therefore, it was really provoked war. And I think what is the solution? Solution is just to, to immediately stop the war and start talking, you know. But the problem is that Ukraine is now not anymore independent country. It's a proxy American country, state, and the war will finish when in Washington will decide it's enough in why, because uh, Secretary uh, of Defense of the United States, Austin, he declared publicly that the, the reason for this war is to weaken Russia. Okay, that's it. When in Washington will decide it's, it's already enough, weakened enough, then they will start this war. But when it will go, it can go to the last Ukrainian. You know, this is what is another dimension of this tragedy is that we now have again, second time in a space of 30 years, that two Slavic nations are fighting for the interest of foreign powers. Before we had in former Yugoslavia, let me say, Serbs and Croats and Bosniak, you know, fighting for the interest of foreign powers. And now we have the same situation. And I'm thinking and trying to find out what's happened with the Slavic soul with our intelligence that we are fighting because we know everybody who has a clear understanding knows that this is not a war this is war for the interest of western capital of capitalist and and so on and this is this is really a big tragedy how widespread do you think is that understanding in slovenia because your election uh, sorry, this election, whether you're elected or not, we're speaking on Sunday, election day. The pro voting is going on now as we speak. Uh, if you were to be elected, it would show that there is a consciousness in Slovenia about what you're saying, that this is a war that's extremely dangerous and it doesn't serve the interests of Slovenians or Europeans. I think the awareness of what you said is very non, almost non-existence. We are that? just few of us. Uh, saying this war, but uh, because the media is uh, very uh, one-sided, you know, we are getting information only from the uh, Western sources, Reuters, AP, which are, you know, filter, going through different filters and so on. Therefore, uh, we do not have also very uh, dis discussions, you know, that is, narration is only 
media is becoming propaganda, like in the United States. Unfortunately, I was living in the United States for many years, and that was a vivid discussion about the possibilities, what was going on. But even in the United States, it started now, one-sided approach. You, you, all the media is just one-sided. And this went, that was the second uh, example was in Western Europe, and now we are part of the West, and the West and the same situation is here. You know, if you are saying what I am saying now to you, I will be accused that I am Putinist, that I am Russian agent, that even I am Chinese agent because I was correspondent for uh, eight years uh, from China. That means uh, we do not have any more an open discussion, you know, because the politicians, uh, but not only Slovenian politicians, but European politicians and all your politicians in the United States, they are behaving like that they are kings, not presidents of democratic countries anymore. These politicians in the US and in Western Europe, they staked a lot on this war in Ukraine. Not only did Austin say it was to weaken Russia, but Biden said in Poland that it was to overthrow yeah. Putin. He said it, and they tried to walk it back, but it was too late. Yeah. So they have invested their entire political futures really on this war. They can not be seen to lose this war, even though they now know. You know. They are now admitting that Ukraine is losing this war. So how dangerous is that? Is that what's driving them to allow Western European and U.S. missiles to strike Russian territory? Where is it headed? How much is it about their political careers? You know, that reminds me of, I had a conversation with Zbigniew Brzezinski when I was correspondent at the United States. He invited me several times because that was the time of dissolution of former Yugoslavia. And he was eager to know different points of view. And then he invited me several times. I was talking with him and, you know, I was surprised. But he said to me, he said, you know, we should dissolve uh, Soviet Union, not so only Soviet Union, but also Russian Federation, that the truth should be uh, Asian Russia, Siberian Russia, European Russia, different states. And this derives from an old Mackinder theory of uh, geopolitics who will rule the world if uh, Ukraine is the central island of the world and if you rule the Ukraine you can rule the this Eurasia. part of uh, Eurasia and this is the I think the predominant theory which the American politicians are still following and this is very very dangerous you know why because also uh, Brzezinski said that Russia without Ukraine is not any more power, big power. Asian power that's mean right? Asian. Yeah, that's mean they had uh, they had to get rid of Ukraine, and therefore the Russia would become very weak uh, country. And I don't think this could happen. You know why? Even if they will replace Putin, then will be even more conservative politician come more nationalistic, and they will Russians will not allow this even. Any kind of regime which will be in power will fight for united uh, Russia. So which side will blink? Because Russia, it's an existential threat to them. They have been invaded several times from the West. They see neo-Nazis in Ukraine. Maybe they're exaggerating. Maybe there's some paranoia. But you have to take into account their point of view. Whereas on the Western side, it's purely a grab for more power that they already have. They don't need. So which side will stop? Or are we headed you towards... Know, that is, that is a question like it was in 1962 during the uh, Cuban crisis when the uh, President Kennedy, he opened that discussion about strategic dilemma of United States. Who will blink the first? Russians, uh, Soviet Union at that time or the United States? Uh, Fortunately, at that time, we have two very intelligent, very powerful politicians who understand what can mean the atomic war, that means the end of everything. And therefore, they make a compromise. And strategic thinking is that, okay, you cannot get 100% of what you would like to, but this is much better to get a little bit less and to preserve the peace. That was in 1962, but unfortunately now the American and Western politicians forget that lesson of President Kennedy and because he said you cannot put a big power in a corner which has atomic weapons to choose between humiliation, defeat 
or aggressive war to use uh, nuclear weapons. And now we are precisely at that point. Yeah. And I, I don't know what, who will blink the first. I think that both, they should speak, they should start talking, you know. And also I am against what they are to saying, you know, uh, we will not talk with Putin because Putin is Hitler and so on. And they are saying ah, it was during uh, Second World War, a British Prime Minister, he was talking with Hitler, yes, and he lost. But, you know, first, Putin is not Hitler. And second, you have to talk, even if you do not produce immediate results, you have to talk and talk and talk and talk. At the end, something will come out. And it is a very unfortunate situation that the leaders of the big forces, uh, uh, for example, Putin and Biden, they didn't talk for three years. Come on, they should took the phone and they could start talking. At the end, they will find some kind of solution. Otherwise, there is the end of the civilization. They're not even pretending to talk. Before yeah. the US invasion of Iraq in 2000, and three, uh, they sent Secretary of State to talk to the Iraqis. It was all, they had made, Nothing. in my view, the Americans made the decision to invade Iraq. Yes. At least they, for the yes. cameras, they pretended they're not even doing that right now. And in the Cuban Missile Crisis, Kennedy was able to save face because they never made it public that the U.S. pulled their missiles yes. yeah. out of Italy and out of Turkey and yes. exchanged yes. the Soviets. Yes. Yes. So they yes. pretended as if they won. But I don't think the Soviets cared because they saved, Khrushchev cared all that much because they saved humanity. And yeah, now we're yeah. dealing with, they're acting like children. Uh, they are not having any dialogue with the Russians. And this is extremely dangerous. Now you are uh, also a scholar of the First World War. Yes. Uh, you've written several books about that. Are you still researching that? Do you see any parallels? That was a very complex way that, that war began. Great power competition, etc. Do you see any parallels between the First World War and what we're in now? I think that there are more parallels between First World War and situation now than with the Second World War. Because Second World War was ideological dispute, communism, uh, Nazism, uh, capitalist countries, you know, this triangle. But before, uh, during the uh, First World War, there were just fighting for the lands, for, for colonies, you know, in this, the, the same situation now. And nobody is speaking or talking in the West, why uh, would like to get Russia? Because Russia is so powerful, rich with resources, and that, the, uh, for example, for artificial intelligence, for electric automobiles, all this rare earth material, uh, the country which will get majority of this rare earth material will have a big technological advantage and i think this is one of the reasons for the war in ukraine uh, and i think also that even during first world war you know they were talking the politicians but they didn't understand that the war and the, the characterization of the war at that time was not like uh, during the Napoleonic Wars, because the tanks were invented, uh, machine guns were invented, new armament was invented, and generals, they didn't understand that this war in during First World War will be different than the wars 50 or 70 years ago. We have now the same situation. We have now, they are talking openly about using tactical nuclear weapons. Nobody doesn't understand what does it mean. Does it mean domino effect? What does it mean? You know, that means technology is more important. And also, they are now using Americans or also, uh, I, I don't know, perhaps also Russians, artificial intelligence. You know, and th their artificial intelligence is selecting, you know, uh, objects which are bombarded uh, and trying to destroy. That's mean not even the people are already deciding what will happen, but the artificial intelligence is taking place. And I think this is even one very important uh, negative and dramatic dimension of this situation in Ukraine. Very frightening, what you're saying. So, Urdush, um, there's another war going on. 
but before I get to Gaza, one more question about it. Ukraine, the, NATO has announced they have opened some corridors where they can actually send troops to fight Russia. They keep saying, Macron being in the lead, and he was at the beginning of this crisis, one of the more open-minded ones. He went to Moscow to talk. He showed that he tried to use diplomacy, even if it didn't work. Now he's, be, he's the big cheerleader yes. to send a coalition of NATO forces inside Ukraine to train them. Russia said they will hit them. They will yes. fire them. Yeah, yeah. And they have allowed Western weapons to be fired into, into Ukraine. What is, how would you uh, assess the percentage of possibility of a hot war between NATO and Russia on the ground and, and how long could it remain conventional? Could it, we have a, a long conventional You know, I war? think that we are now in the same situation, let me be the beginning of the Vietnam War. Americans at that time, they have uh, uh, their uh, military advisors over there. There were 15,000 of them. Right. And then the American uh, forces coming there to, to guard them. And that is now the, precisely the same situation. Uh, and I think the Russians will try to destroy them and it will be a direct, starting a direct conflict between NATO and Russia. It will be, at the beginning, it will be, I think, uh, conventional. I hope that this will be the end because also, you know, NATO is not prepared for a general war. And maybe uh, they're prepared uh, because also European armies are quite weak. You know, German has 75,000 soldiers. Uh, Britain, I, I saw around 50,000, you know, that's mean uh, Russia has more than 1 million uh, soldiers. That's mean NATO at that point is not ready to, for any kind of direct clash with Russia. And I hope that the politician will finally understand that they should start to talk and to listen to two politicians. I think there are only two sane politicians in Europe at present. This is Pope, which is calling for negotiation. And second is uh, Prime Minister of Hungary, I don't like him, I have to tell you, I'm liberal, he's authoritarian, but concerning the war in Ukraine, he's the only one saying NATO was, we joined NATO as a defensive alliance, not offensive alliance, and he said we will fight only for defense of the regional member states. Not uh, and uh, Ukraine is not member of NATO. Therefore, we don't have any kind of obligation to go there and fight uh, in in Ukraine. Especially in July, it will be even a more important question during the uh, meeting of the NATO countries in, in Washington. Washington. They will decide about uh, to set up a global NATO. That means enlargement of NATO to Asia. What does it mean? This means they will prepare war with China. And you know, once we had that saying here that all the roads lead to Rome, but now all the roads are uh, leading to Beijing. Why? Because China is the only country in the world which can challenge the American uh, supremacy and Western supremacy. That means Americans and Western countries, especially Europe also, instead of making cooperation, they are trying to fight China on uh, either technological trade side and, and to prevent their ad advancement and their development. And this is a very scary situation. Indeed it is. Now let's go to Gaza for a moment. This is an also a big issue. And we, we have been uh, in the north of England uh, covering a couple of independent and uh, third party candidates. We're seeing across the Western world that major establishment parties, right and left they call them, although those meaning those words have very yeah. meaning like before, that they they coalesce on Gaza, they're absolutely for, for Israel, they deny that there's a genocide going on, they're openly helping this genocide with arms and, and, and money, and on Ukraine they are all together as well. So is there a, a, a growing awareness? Now you're running as an independent, which you should talk a little yes. bit about because that's unusual. Yes. You were telling me here in Slovenia. You are, why are you running as an independent? And do you think there's a growing sense amongst the voters of Western Europe and even the United States and Britain that the two parties are bankrupt and that we need 
to break away from them and start something new. You know, I'm running for independent uh, because I don't want uh, to get orders from any political party. Uh, I would pursue, you know, first our national interest and especially the peace. This is what is the most important. That means peace and uh, uh, we will, I would uh, fight for the preservation of the international order, you know, I am against this order, which is American order, uh, which is decided in Washington DC. This is the problem, because what what's going on now in in uh, in Israel is according to that American world order. Because if you are our friend, you have more rights, you are more equal, you can do whatever you want to, and this is what Israel is doing there. This is a genocide. This is murder of all murders. And you see Americans are supporting in Europe. Okay, they are saying, no, you should stop. But still, they are not even, I don't know, no one leading uh, politician of very of the b biggest European countries, he didn't use the word genocide for what's going on in, in, in Gaza. Even uh, international court said that it is what's going on in, in, in uh, in Gaza, it's, it could be a genocide, but our politicians in Europe, they are not saying, they're saying mass murder. Mass murder is a different thing than, than genocide. And therefore, I think it, it's a crisis of morality. And this is, this is the biggest problem. You know, every empire in the history, if you're looking, for example, the uh, example of the uh, Roman Empire, it was a moral crisis of the beginning that could lead to the destruction. And it was too large, too big empire. And also on the latest stage, and I consider Western domination of the world as an empire, and at the end of the latest stages of development of empires, you have uh, the, the empires would like to preserve their power with the force, with military force. And precisely this is going on now. Uh, in 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 the world, sp especially in in Ukraine and also in uh, in in Gaza, and this is what's going in Gaza. This is racism, apartheid system. You know, I cannot imagine that this can go on, and that United States is supporting this. This is this is out of question. You know, I. I I'm really appalled. You know, I'm I'm I I don't have words to explain my indignation my my i don't know what to do to say what to do that we are allowing you know we, we say at the end of the second world war never more never again never again yes and again we, we are witnessing this this kind of situation uh, unbelievable well it's the it's the descendants of the victims of the genocide and second world war that are perpetrating this one uh, which is most extraordinary but this moral outrage that you're expressing is being felt and shown by let's say the american students on the campus and the police went in and violently broke them up yes, yes. just on saturday uh, of this weekend they uh, there were thousands of people at the white house they had a two mile long red banner that they circled the White House with. I have seen in Wales, where I just came from, a, 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 a march up the main street, St. Mary's, and I, had, I was in the train station in Rotterdam a couple of months ago, and all of a sudden, a pro-Palestine or anti-genocide no, but... protest. Is that growing? Is that fueling this, this independence, this movement away from the establishment, away from the, away from the major parties? I don't think so. This no is, optimism. In this part of the Europe that we are living, this is no, not the case. You know, even in Germany, can you imagine? In Germany, they are pro 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 making a prohibition to to be pro-Palestinian, you know, you have, you are accused that you are anti-Semite and you could be imprisoned and so on. And this Germany, you, you cannot understand that this could be, you know, here in Slovenia, I have to tell you, we are all free, but the problem is we can demonstrate and we have the pro-Palestinian demonstrations here, but they were very small, not weak. The people are not, are not mobilized, you know, they, they be, 
they are very passive, you know, this is the problem. And we are also 2 million people, you know, the, the small country. The, what the, the big movement should start in somewhere in the biggest, the bigger European countries like France, like Germany, you know, uh, Italy and so on. But we don't have this kind of movement and, and still in Europe. Also in United States, you have some, but you know what is the difference between the movement, peace movement now and peace movement during Vietnam War? Because during Vietnam War, you have a draft system in the States and the people were fighting, fighting against going uh, to the war, you know. But here, in this could be the turning point in Europe. If NATO will decide to intervene in, in uh, uh, Ukraine and we will be forced to send our soldiers, Slovenian soldiers, to fight mm. Russians, then the people will start to think what's going on and, and you know we are not ready to 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 send our soldiers fighting for inter, i don't know foreign interest uh, over there and this could be a turning point but still i think uh, the the worst situation is still not uh, coming and uh, therefore we are quite passive passive which is uh, unfortunate unfortunate uh, situation. To get uh, Europeans to fight this war, they are putting this idea out. Macron is saying it. Biden said it at a state dinner with Macron just on Saturday that Putin is threatening all of Europe. Yeah. And in the same breath, he said, but he's failing in Kharkiv. So my question to you is, how could he <laughs> fail in one little small okay. part of Ukraine? And he's failing there, but yet he's threatening all of yeah, Europe. Only, Explain only, that to me. <laughs> only he knows. You know, this is, this is a joke. Uh, so on the one other hand, see, Russia yeah. is very weak. If you will be follow, uh, if you will trust all this... <laughs> reports from uh, uh, Ukraine, then uh, Ukraine should be near Moscow, you know. Yeah. Uh, but the, it is just the reverse reverse situation. I think this is also the result because America is approaching the elections, presidential elections. And I think the American president administration will try to retain the same situation until the elections. Yeah. After elections, something can happen. Yeah. If there will be a... Trump, I think he will make some kind of compromise, but he will be on the one hand even more dangerous towards China. This, this and Gaza, be. probably. And Gaza, yeah. also because he's more pro pro Israeli. But with Russia, Russia, he might Biden. he might make. Yeah, it. with the, with Russia, he, he could make some compromise. Like Orban in the states. Yeah, sense, that's but with, with if he will be re-elected, Biden, then we know who will rule uh, America. You know what is. What's my thesis is that it is now more important who will be elected as a vice president than of president because you you know you if you are looking uh, watching uh, President Biden he is not anymore in position uh, to be a, a president and I don't know if he can survive four years more and Biden uh, or this Biden and Trump is is very unpredictable also therefore. It is very dangerous that the biggest, the most important country in the world has only these two choices. Dangerous ones. Yeah, so he, uh, Putin can't take, he can't take Kharkiv, but he's going to, he's going to take over France. So yeah. that's, that's what yeah. we're, we're made to believe this. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just extraordinary uh why are people believing this because they shouldn't believe this but they're not paying attention maybe right people are distracted uh and they're not paying attention now let me ask you this question then what role is social media and independent media playing in at least opening some more minds to be independent and to reject both the major parties and all of our countries the establishment parties what role is independent media yeah. Social media playing. Now. I think that uh, the freedom of the press and different opinion, that's the precondition for any kind of democracy. And I think this is a very dangerous road, what's going on now in Europe and also in the United States, that media is becoming mostly 
tool of uh, government uh, propaganda. It's everywhere the same. You didn't have vivid discussion, you know, pro and contra. Not anymore. Not anymore. I am watching also American television, not only European televisions. No, you have just one straight opinion, like during the former Soviet Union, during communist time, you have only one line and you have now the same line here. And this is, I think, very important, very dangerous situation. And we have somehow to overcome this situation. Uh, when the um, media will be free again, then I think our democracy will develop. And this is very also important for European Union. And these elections are so important for us because European Union is becoming more authoritarian uh, organization than it was before. You know, and uh, uh, it is now very important uh, to see which group of countries of the political parties will prevail in the European Parliament. The extreme right, you, you do not have a left anymore. The left is like non existent. The more aggressive, yeah, but green are, Greens are Germany. so aggressive, yeah. uh, liberals are also so aggressive, they are for war. When you have now a contradiction that the mostly. Uh, right-wing or conservative parties are uh, against the war, are for uh, discussion, for talks with Russia, and the left-wing are fro for war and uh, continuation the war to the last Ukrainians. This is unbelievable situation, you know, this is... Uh, uh, I cannot explain this. It is not rationally possible to explain this kind of dilemma. Yeah, well, social media and uh, independent media are uh, trying to make some inroads, and they are fighting back against that. If you looked at the Twitter files and other examples, the government is working with social media companies to take people's accounts down, and they're working to limit and smear independent media because they, I think they started to fear that their uh, power is being threatened, and yes. the establishment yeah. of power, so yeah. they have to yeah. fight back. Now, let me ask you a couple of questions. You told me you haven't gotten any uh, support from, or any coverage from the media here. Tell me. No, I, I got very small and very limited coverage because I am ha, somehow of an anti-establishment candidate because, you know, all the political parties were for war in Ukraine, you know, against the talks, uh, peace talks. And I was from the beginning with a group of intellectuals who were producing many uh, statements uh, against the war and we were asking the immediate stop of the war and at that time all the parties were still for the for the war now they try to change a little bit because of the elections approaching but uh, that was the reason i think that i got very small coverage you know i got very limited, you know, I was not even invited to all these uh, big debates. Even, you know, I have to tell you, I was correspondent. Uh, I was living out of the country almost for 30 years. I was correspondent for the United States. I was con uh, correspondent uh, eight years more from China. I was in Kosovo and so I was in Arab countries, in Iran and so on. I had the most experience of all candidates which are now competing for European Parliament and only I didn't get uh, the space. All of other they were yeah. getting, they ignored and they boycott just me because I think they were afraid. They know that, they, that I have so many arguments, that I have knowledge that they cannot defeat me and therefore they boycott me if I but if you're not on television it is a small country you're non non existent and that's the that's what an the, irony that's the because problem. as I remember you tell me since you started with Yugoslav media and yeah. Yugoslavia being a very important country in the yeah. non aligned movement you got a lot of access. You've interviewed uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, I believe. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. You interviewed Saddam Hussein? Yes. Uh, I was with him, you know. I was the first one uh, when uh, Khomeini came to um, uh, Tehran from France. I was the first journalist to get interview with a French woman. And uh, 
Then uh, I was uh, in a peace initiative. I was uh, assistant to the uh, late academician Vladimir Dedier, who was president of the uh, Tribunal for the War Crimes in Vietnam. And he was mediator in the war between Iran and uh, Iraq. Uh, yes. And uh, I spent a week uh, in discussions together with Dedier, uh, with Saddam Hussein. Nothing was came out of this, but you know, I was with him, therefore I have some quite rich experience uh, and you know, and I also published several books on First World War and right. the current events and they just ignore me. They ignore Castro me. too, didn't you interview Fidel Castro? No, no, I didn't. Oh, you didn't get to. No. Okay. Uh, but now they just they ignore, ignore you. They ignore me. You You're know why? You know why? why? Because I would join independent members like Clara Daly. Claire Daly, yeah. Yes, Make therefore, and the, this establishment is afraid, you know, okay, we will not be any more uh, uh, straight to our country as we are now. Therefore, it is not in the interest of the Slovenian political elite that I would be become a member of Europe, Europe, European Parliament. And I think that that is the, re the reason that they boycott me more or less. And most of the voters are over 50 and you're one of the most recognizable faces in, uh, in Slovenia. You are... Yeah, okay, I was, you know, uh, the younger generation, I don't know what will happen in these elections, is not interesting in the uh, voting, especially European. And, uh, you know, the majority of the voters are in the category of 50 plus. Yeah. Therefore, and I think uh, my ne name recognition, that group is quite uh, high. Yeah. Therefore, you know, one, some, uh, some analysts predict that it, I could be a, a big surprise at the elections. I don't know. I don't know what can happen. I am not sure. Um, well, we're going to find out in a couple of hours from now. We're recording this on yeah. the next day. <laughs> How did you fund the campaign? Ah, uh, how, how do we, you know, I, uh, because our uh, system is favoring uh, political parties, I was not able to run as independent candidate, therefore I took uh, support from two small non-governmental, uh, non-parliamentary -non uh, parties, right. and uh, we will spend, you know, for the whole budget, our budget is around 30,000 euros. That is more, and I'm also using my own money for, you know, driving around and, and so on and so on. Therefore, uh, it is the most strict and uh, small, we have very small budget, you know, that because the big parties, they will spend 10 times more than we do. Advertising on TV, the other candidates, on yes, video, you yes. haven't been able no, to do that. We don't have Just posters videos. you had, basically. Yeah, posters, yes, yeah. yes, yes. No yes. newspaper advertisements. No, no, but you know, I, I was lucky. I, I got support from, for example, for some very important and influential Slovenian. It was a, 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 a Father Gerjan, mm. who is well-known Catholic priest here in Slovenia, very devoted to peace, peace, peace and peace, and he supported me uh, several times and he has a big influence in Slovenian public. I hope I, that I will get uh, some uh, something uh, from this uh, affiliation. And also, I hope that my message, that it is time for reason, that means politicians, reason is the most important, and it is time for peace, will become a slogan which will be on the, uh, which will be uh, in the mind of the voters when we we'll come to the voting uh, stations today thank you very much for speaking okay, to us. <laughs> okay. so orders you've received three messages from three mainstream newspapers okay. here what yeah. did they say on your text message uh, where are you will be waiting for and uh, we would like to contact you after the results will be announced and uh, I don't know, uh, I'm surprised because so far they didn't pay any attention to me and now suddenly they are asking me, I don't know, what does it mean? I hope we good news. <laughs> what did you tell them when they said they wanted a statement from you? Uh, after I result? told you, oh, it's unfortunate. Uh, 
how do you remember me? Because so far you didn't even mention me. Why now you suddenly start asking me when I will be after the announcement of the results? I don't know. <laughs> if they have some kind of internal information, I don't know anything. And did they respond to you? They haven't responded yet? No, they didn't. Yeah. No. They're embarrassed, maybe. I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, that's very funny. No, I don't know, but uh, it's... I don't know if this means anything, maybe just curiosity. They would like uh, to ask me if I am uh, disappointed. Yes, uh, maybe they want to humi yeah, yeah. humiliate you that you lost. Confession speech. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that is. The concession. Yes. No, but... Uh, but you did. You you decided to tell I them. Will, no, I will tell them uh, something <laughs> straight. That it was not fair what they did. And... Uh, that it is very unfortunate if the people didn't understand that now that is a question of between we are choosing between peace and war and I was the only candidate which uh, proclaiming uh, negotiations and peace from many months till from starting of this uh, unfortunate war in Ukraine so where are we going now? Oh, no, we are now here. We are 10 seconds up yeah. to the huts here. You see. We're going to the restaurant where you're going to meet your supporters, is that yes. right? Yes, yes. Okay. That's it. I am here. Yeah. On my usual parking space. <laughs> okay. okay. Is that reserved? <laughs> okay. Going to the polling booth on Sunday, election day for the European Parliament. All across Europe today, our entire new European Parliament is being elected. That is the most important, the European Parliament. Right. I vote for myself. What a surprise. So now there's six votes for you. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's the referendum. Yes, the referendum, yes. Take what is the referendum the, about? On uh, what is on, on can cannabis, on uh, cannabis. Potential voice, yes. And on uh, the finish of the life. Euthanasia. Euthanasia. Fifteen minutes. Yes. Well, you seem very relaxed. Uh, till, till, yes, I'm very relaxed. <laughs> what is the latest? Are you hearing rumors that uh, there could be something unexpected? <laughs> but these are just rumors. You know? Yes. Uh, Wishful thinking. Okay. <laughs> well, the, the, we will see in a few hours. The suspense is building. Yeah. Another no, no, no. three hours. I don't know. I hope for the best, but uh, only God knows what will happen. Okay. But I, I, I got the news now from Germany that the left wing of social democrats they will win and that the first spitzel candidate she announced a new german policy toward uh, ukraine and she promised that she will finish war in ukraine and completely change german uh, attitude toward ukrainian war what is the smell what? you smell this it sound, did the can cannabis uh, referendum pass already? <laughs> that by 8 o'clock there could be some uh, no, preliminary information. It's now on, past 9. On European. Ah. How, how, how the next European Parliament would look like. Yeah. Uh, people's um, parties, European people's parties are the winners. And the second are socialists. And the rest I don't know. Yeah. The election party for Urush, the supporters have gathered at this restaurant in Ljubljana. 
waiting for the results. Ameriški okay. Ameriški predsednik Nixon je sedemkrat kandidiral, pa ni bi izvoljen osmi včera to pa predsednik. Jaz pa mislim, mi bomo pa v prvič kandidiral, pa jaz sem predpričal, da bomo dober rezultat. Fifteen more minutes. They're still recounting your votes. Yeah, yeah. They want to make sure this cannot be. I got so many votes that they had need another fifteen minutes. Maybe another time. Yeah. What about fifty-one percent of the of the eligible voters vote? Okay. One third. Even less. This is, this is a temporary result. You cannot say nothing if you have only half of the vote. I think that we are on a good way to see what has happened. Here is the mid-generation situation. Mislim, da je naš program apsolutno aktualen in mislim, da bo volimo telo to sprejelo, če ne prej na volitvah parlamentarnih, ki bodo čez dve leti, ker mi bomo z našim javnim programom nadaljevali in mislim, da bo prišlo do povezovanja med strankami, zato ker mir je preveč zdragocen, od mira smo mi vsi odvisni in mi ne bomo popustili in se bomo za naše cilje borili naprej. Hvala lepa. We have to wait for official results tomorrow. Yes. But now I think uh, uh, it's time to confess, you know. <laughs> Unfortunately, we didn't get uh, uh, enough votes. I'm disappointed with the elections because our slogan, it's time for reason and it's time for peace, was not understood by, by our voters. Why? And this is really surprising because we are now in the midst, in the middle of the most severe political crisis after the uh, Cuban crisis in 1962. And it could happen that we will witness a new European war and the people didn't understand our message. Why? Because from the beginning, we were not um, allowed to express our position to the people. We were boycotted by mostly uh, by the main media and also by press media because, you know, the, all the political parties, they, are, they were still uh, a month ago uh, trying to convince the people that they sh should prolong the war in Ukraine till the defeat of the Russia. And I think this is impossible. And I think that this could lead to the world war. And therefore, and we will still go on with our efforts. You know that the people will understand our message because without peace, you cannot develop uh, also European Union and democracy. Therefore, we will go on, and I think in the elections which will take place, parliamentary elections in the next two years, I think we will be uh, more forceful to convince the voters that we, we are on the right way and the right path of the history. Is that, is that what you said, more or less? Is that what you said uh, up there, more or less? Huh? That's what you said there, yeah. more or less? More or less. Yeah. The same. A little shorter. Thank you, Uroš. Uh, <laughs> Ja, ich bin nicht